everybody, it's me, Kurt. Can you believe it? Oh, where have you guys been? I've missed you. Okay, hey, welcome back. This is part two of a two-part interview I did with my good friend, Paul Vogt. I won't waste any more time. Here is part two, enjoy. So the next thing on IMDb was Princess Diaries 2, but you did you film that before Rerun Show or was that a during? No, actually I did, um, I, I went to Mad TV. So what happened is they asked me, would I be interested in coming over to Mad TV while we were finishing up Rerun Show? And it had already been on the air for several, like three, four years maybe by the long Yeah, for a long time. Okay. I, I joined like the, I think nine, 10 and 11 seasons were mine. Oh, okay. Or eight, nine and 10, I always forget. So I was, you know, later. Right. Um, Will Sasso was leaving, and I think they wanted, you know, a new big guy. Right. David Salzman, who was running Rerun Show, ran, it was his show. And they also did a thing where they only hired you for four episodes, and then they oh. saw whether or not you were going to stay. And I said, yeah, I can't do that. So you need to hire me as a regular <laughs> cast member, and this is my first year, and we'll move on from there. And they were like, okay. I was like, oh, thank God. Did you come in mid-season or did you start at the top of the season? I came in, I think it was a little bit, I think at my first season I did like 13, 14 episodes out of a 22. Okay. Then I think it was on Mad. And while I was on Mad, he was like, come be on this Princess Diaries too. You'll wear a wig like a judge and you'll talk. Right. He yeah. was lovely. Like I said, I was lucky enough to meet him at the theater and doing theater with him. And we were like two idiots. Like during... The, he would challenge me during Happy Days of Musical and be like, do something about Yo-Yo Ma in the show tonight. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, great, challenge is on. And I would do this whole, you know, I'd find moments to, for that one, I started getting upset about Bambi's mom and I'm like, Bambi's mom, Bambi's mom, Yo-Yo Ma, Yo-Yo. <laughs> and the audience is staring at me, but you hear this one guy in the back and he, um, yeah, he was delightful. Parades. There, there literally were, when we did Princess Diaries 2, he took over the back lot and we did a huge parade and oh. each department would build floats. Yes. And stuff. That was on there that. a whole group called The Fogs, which are friends of Gary's, because these are the people he would put in oh. these movies. And so I was a friend of Gary, but then eventually I actually got roles. Like I got parts. But I just wanted to, I knew that I, I, I love that you had a friendship with him. It wasn't just a working relationship that you you knew him and you knew him like in such a friendly, nice manner. I got to know him fairly well. The thing is his loyalty to people, like he's, he's he was history, he was television history, writing on Dick Van Dyke. When yeah. he did his movies, the people that he wrote with on Dick Van Dyke were, show, were writers on his movies. Like he yeah. was loyal, he would bring his guys in his loyalty and just, and he also knew, he knew if you were trying to get to know him just to get ahead. Reno 911, you were on an episode of that. Were you on one episode of Reno 911? We, I did two. The first one, they, again, they're fantastic people. And, yeah. you know, again, because of Matt TV, you become pals with these people. And Thomas Lennon and Ben Guerin and, and uh, yeah. Carrie Kenny. And they asked me to be on the show and they explained that they wanted me to do, and there's no script for that show. Like they just give you an outline of the scene right. and they're like, you're a guy hold up in his house. You're a paintball sniper and you don't want your mail. Your wife has left you. And I'm like, got it. So I had this paintball gun and do it. And they come and attack me. And then I ran and improvised taking the car. Right. And then they were like, Oh my God, that's great. Everybody always steals the car. I did what they wanted without being told and stuff. Awesome. And we had so much fun that then they wrote another, paintball sniper bit into another episode and Peter showed up and we attack uh, <laughs> the guys that attack us. Carlos Alvinacri and the- You did a voice for a Disney, Lilo and Stitch too. Stitch has a glitch. I, a friend of ours was directing it and I just do, I do an alligator guard and I do like an old lady crossing the street. But, they, but you know, but that's was, my dream. That is my dream. It was so it. cool. Demetria actually sings in that at the end there's a big song, the big Hawaiian song, and Dimitri doubles the voice and does the harmony. Well, of course he does. Of it. And so 
it's yeah, it's crazy. But then it, while all this is going on, this amazing career, you're like going and doing the opera. Gary Marshall, Gary got to do an opera. Again, lucked out. Gary's like, I want you to be in this opera. It's a part. You don't really have to sing. I was like, oh, thank God. The Grand Duchess of Geraldstein. And it was a, um, an opera that's not done too often, but it's a comedic opera. And so LA Opera wanted Gary to do it and bring it up to comedy. That was, yes, an incredible, crazy experience. Again, I would not have had if I didn't know Gary Marshall. So, And the best costume I've ever worn. It was literally built on my body. I had so many costume fittings. A couple of the fittings would last two hours long. The most comfortable, three-piece, gorgeous. I don't even know what that material was. I didn't steal any of it, and I should have. Right. Steal the whole thing. Always right. steal costumes. Always steal. <laughs> Say that again. My advice to any of the youth watching, steal things. From shows you're doing, not just the the like, not like at the Seven <laughs> Eleven, not at <laughs> Ralph's. Don't go to Ralph's and start stealing stuff. Thick and Thin TV series you were on. Thick and Thin, Paula Pell from Orlando. It was her TV show. She sold it. Okay, it Paula filmed. Pell was the head writer for SNL for years, but she started she out came, in Orlando. So she was at Adventurers Club with everybody at yeah. Disney. She did a video to be a performer on Saturday Night Live, and Lauren Michaels was like, "How about being a writer?" And she's like, "I don't really know. We'll figure it out." Becomes the head writer, right. Tina Fey's best friend. She writes movies, she acts, and everything. This was a TV show about her growing up in Orlando. Right. They filmed it. It was Steven Spielberg and Kate Capshaw's daughter was the lead. Peter and I, again, got to be recurring characters on it, and then it never aired. Unbelievable. It never aired. Uh, and, and then Blonde Ambition. Blonde Ambition. That's the Simpson and Luke Wilson. Yeah. Jessica Simpson movie. So again, Gary Marshall's son, Scott Marshall, this is one of his first movies he directed. He asked me if I'd be in it. I said, sure. And we did it in Shreveport and Andy Dick was in it. And Jessica Simpson, so nice, super nice. And you just see her, she lived in a world where like when her hair was a mess, somebody would brush it. Like she was really lovely. And there are other people that weren't so lovely, I'll talk about that another time. The other thing I want to talk about is 2007, you made your Broadway debut as Edna Turnblatt in Hairspray. On Crazy. Broadway. Broadway. Crazy. pictures of you with freaking John Waters. Crazy. Like, Again, goes back to Gary Marshall because rerun show, playing Mrs. Garrett, I got a lot of attention. Because when that aired, people were like, who the hell? Right. Doing Mad TV, I got a call from Craig Burns from Telsey in my dressing room. And he's like, hi, we're interested in you taking over Harvey uh, in Hairspray. And I'm like, eh? but I just started on Mad TV and signed like this five-year deal with a three-year out. And because I, I was like, I don't know if I want to be here five years. And so I said, I can't right now. But Craig Burns, God love him, he stayed in contact with me. Wow. They came to LA you know, a few years later to set, they were having auditions for the Vegas cast. Right. And he called me up and he said, could you come in? And I was like, oh, should I, should I, should I? And I talked to my friend, Jessica Rush, again from Orlando, but met her out here. And Jessica talked me into going to the audition in LA. And I walked into the audition and they said, we're flying you to Vegas to meet the team. I walk in the room and it's Jerry Mitchell, Jack O'Brien, like 30 people. And I said some stupid stuff. Yeah. And Jack O'Brien's like, you are a delight. And I closed my book and went, thank you. And I walked out of the room. <laughs> and they all laughed. And I came back in. And they're like, ah. And so I did my Edna stuff. Now, I thought I was there for male authority figure. I thought I was there to play oh, yeah. the four different roles. Right. They had me do Edna. And that was it. Bernie Telsey walks me out of the room. And in the hallway, he goes, do you want New York, Vegas, or the tour? And I was like, I want New York. Yeah. He goes, we're going to see what we can do. So then at the time, New York wasn't open, but they needed someone to take over from Harvey in Vegas. So that's what I ended up doing. They brought me to Vegas. I hung out with Harvey for two weeks. That's how I got to know Harvey. Took over from him, did this 90 minute version of Vegas. Yeah. And a lot of people think the show didn't work, but the show was working. We were doing well, but because a new company bought the place, they wanted to do their own thing. That led to, I was asked to do the first regional production at North Shore in Boston area. Oh, yeah. So this was the production that was gonna be done and all regional production would be set from this. And so my friend Jackie Seiden said, 
I said, Jackie, do I want to do regional? Because I really want to get to Broadway. Because at this point, a lot of the people from Vegas were going to Broadway. Right. And I was like, I really want Broadway. And she goes, you have to do this regional production because you're going to cock block every motherfucker from doing it. And I was like, all right, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. So I do that North Shore. Mark Shaman and the gang come out and see me. I get a little meeting with Matt Lenz, who's the associate director. I meet Margot Lyon, the producer in New York. We have a work session. On the way home, I get a call. I'm going to Broadway. So that's that all, it all connected to that. And then I think it was like, that was December, Jan, February, January. And then by February, I was in New York starting the show and would cry every night. I'm sure. Before I had to get up on that pop because I was like, oh, I'm really playing like one of the greatest roles ever. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. musical theater, like it was surreal. It was surreal. Hey, Tracy, hey, baby, look at me. I'm the cutest Jakey that you ever did see. Hey, Tracy, hey, baby, look at us. Where is there a team that's our best? Where you lost Sonic Go? I'm like, pass now. Red carpet ride. Yes, I know the world's spinning fast now. Tell all the bridges how to step aside. I have the craziest, weirdest hairspray life because I've done every version of hairspray except for like the national tour and the movie. Right. So, because I, I did the Vegas 90 minute, I did the first regional, I did Broadway. That first regional was in the round. Then I did it, the Muni was outdoor for, for 11,000 people. Right. Then I've done it regionally in normal stages, regionally in the round. I did Hairspray live on TV. Right. And I did the Hairspray concerts with John Waters in Baltimore. That's what the, that's, the Hairspray That's where those pictures are from. So I had met John Waters on Broadway, but then I got to do this symphony thing that was Indianapolis Symphony and Baltimore Symphony concert version of the show with John Waters narrating and so we spent a month with him of rehearsal and stuff and then you would do this week of shows and I did that twice it was uh two different years that we did it Amazing. and John Waters and the original casting woman and doing it in Baltimore and having Divine's family come to me afterwards and say you remind us of Glenn and you're you're and just like crying like an idiot because oh that's all I would want to do is try to honor yeah his work and what he did not do an impression of him but try to get that spirit and you know so those concerts in Baltimore with John Waters and then, then the cast is like Beck Level and Susie Moser and and uh you know Mickey Dolan's played my husband they uh, uh George Wentz played Wilbur at one point, and he played oh, Edna after me on Broadway, so. Holy, when did you work, for, didn't you work, didn't you do it with Jerry Mathers? Didn't he play your husband at one Jerry Mathers was my husband. I had three husbands. Jim J. Bullock was a husband. Oh, um, Bob Walton was a husband, he's a big Broadway guy. Uh, Eddie Mecca in Vegas, the big ragu. Yes. Vernon Shirley, like it doesn't stop. Like I it's know, all, right? your, life, your, your life should be called, thanks Gary. That, that should be your memoir. <laughs> oh, it is. it is. Like, holy smoke. But it's so weird. And then the other thing that you did that I'm mad about, because I have begged Disney for years to do this, is uh, you played Ursula in a production of The Little Mermaid. This was at the Muni in St. Louis. And it's, uh, I, I mean, it's a great theater. And it's this outdoor theater. And it literally, it seats 11,000 yeah. people. Like, they give 1,000 tickets away, night, like the last couple rows for free. It's huge and they're so fantastic and I I got to do hairspray there and the guy that ran it at the time his name was Paul Blake and he was like would you like to play her so I'm like yeah and he had a deal with Disney so they had to have meetings and he told them that he wanted me to play it and whoever was in charge I, I don't know if they were dealing like Peter Schneider or whoever they were dealing with at the time in Disney theatricals knew who I was from my time at Disney like there were people that it knew street and sphere and knew my name and knew you know uh, who I was and they knew that I would take care of the role like so they they yeah. approved it. they said yes because I think of my time working at the parks they were like oh like he's a He's one of us. He's like, he's in the, that pixie you know, he's not going to 
be yeah. crazy with it. And I tried to do, again, I didn't do an impression of Pat Carroll, but I tried to definitely get closer to Pat Carroll. And I think I sang like the Faith Prince, you know, keys or something. There, There's so many great Muni stories. I don't even have good ones compared to other people. Like when they did when they did a Beauty and the Beast and the woman who played the wardrobe and there was a raccoon in one of the drawers. <laughs> Cause it's outside, you're literally outside. <laughs> it's fantastic. But yes, so yes, I think Ursula was fantastic. Uh, um, so then you go to one of, you, one of my favorite things that again was just sort of like, I don't think on a lot of people's radar, maybe because it was called the Big Gay Sketch Show. And again, my friend Scott King, the head writer of Mad TV, was creator head writer Rosie O'Donnell was a producer. Right? I had just finished Hairspray. <clears throat> I happened to be in New York and he's like, do you want to be on the show? And I'm like, yeah. And so he wanted me to do a Mrs. Garrett sketch. Oh That's like one oh, of the- color. That's one I looked up and I'd forgotten. I was like, oh yeah, I can't show clips of that. Oh my God, it's so <laughs> funny. It's so wrong. And except, we had a good time. except when you make the girl who plays Natalie eat the ice cream. And I knew that was an improv thing because she starts laughing. And yeah. I was like, I know they rehearsed this. And you're like, don't put that down, Tootie, or Natalie. And then I'll say, you're like, no, eat it. Eat it all, Natalie. Eat it all. And you're shoveling yeah. her face. And she's laughing. And I'm like, it's moments like that that are gold. Hello, Kate McKinnon. I mean, yeah, everybody on that show, they're all fantastic. Yeah, Kate, she moved out here for a while. We would go to my friend Scott King's. We would watch Fear the Walking Dead when it first came out. Yeah. We did a Rosie O'Donnell cruise. Oh, a couple funny. of times yeah. as the Big Gay Sketch Show. So we got to go on the cruise for free and then we would do the show one night and that would be it. Like we just had to do it once. And the one cruise we did from LA down to New Mexico, I think we were in Puerto Vallarta and, and Kate McKinnon and I got a jet ski together and she hadn't been on one. And so we were riding it and you know, you're supposed to like lean into the turns <laughs> and she didn't and we flipped it. Oh, God. So we weren't that far out, but we were out there. And so... I held on to it and got her back on, right. but I could get back on because I'm a large man. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's like way up there. And so I said to her, I'm going to hold on to the side. You just slowly gun it and get me to shallower water. And so, you know, the first time she was like, man, I got, so I swam to it slower. And then we tried it again. <laughs> Meanwhile, like here comes a rowboat of lifeguards and they're trying, and I'm like, again, the side of the boat's like this. I'm like, and they're, they're speaking in Spanish. And I'm like, I just kept going, no, no. <laughs> okay, just go. So eventually it worked and she got me to the shallow water and stuff. But I always say, yeah, that Kate and I almost died and oh my God. whatever they are to, together. See, this is the stuff I want. These are the stories I need to hear. <laughs> but she was brilliant. She had a, that character she had on the show about the little boy who wanted to be Yeah, Fitzwilliam. Like and that. one of the best um, Sally Field impressions. She does a Boniva commercial on the Big A Sketch Show that her Ellen became pretty famous, but her Sally Field is. You played Mrs. Garrett like everywhere. Every show, you might as well just play Mrs. Garrett. I'm like, sitting in the house that lady built. You were a voice in Igor, the animated feature e Igor. Yes. You were Buzz Offman, right? Yes. Buzz Offman, which I love that name. I thought that was Yeah, cute. he's the fly. He's, the, he's a fly with a scientist's head. <laughs> yes. Help me, help me. Yeah, exactly. That's the yeah. yes. Then enter Hannah Montana. Hey, here's yeah. something for the kids. Bring the kids back in the room now. Here, Hannah Montana, you played the next door neighbor in like one episode, and then years later, maybe? Peter played next door neighbor. I did Hannah Montana. You know, I went to the audition and I was like, oh God. I, you know, Hannah, it was nothing. It was yeah. like the, it, it hadn't even aired yet. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want to do a kid show on Disney. And I went to the audition and, and they're like, I was late. Like an <laughs> idiot, just an idiot, such a jerk. I was late, I didn't want to go, I go in the room and it's very nice casting people. And I was like, they're like, oh, we'll just give you a minute to look it over. I said, no, I'm fine, let's just do it. And I read it and I'm like, oh, he's an annoying neighbor. And I did a little Paul Lynn sort of like, you know, hey, what you doing, man? Just like, and right. they were like, love it. By the time I walked out of my car, they're like, they hired me, like I got the part. I was like, oh God. So then I go and I do the episode 
Right. Billy Ray Cyrus right. is like, you're real funny. I think we're going to have you back and stuff. And I'm like, oh, thanks. And Miley, and this was before, it was the third episode, hadn't yeah. aired. Nobody was anybody except for Billy Ray Cyrus. Uh, oh, man, it's Mr. Donzig. And he's wearing his robe again. Yeah, well, count your blessings. At least this time it's a long one. <laughs> so, Stewart family. What would another leaf from your tree be doing in my hot tub? I, I don't know. Uh, maybe he wanted to party. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't... Then it airs, and I tell, and they say, we want you to come back, we don't know when. And I said, I've been asked to do hairspray in Vegas. Right. So I'm leaving here. So if you want to use me, you have to use me before that. Right. Of course, the day before I leave, they're like, we need you in the next couple of weeks. I'm like, I'm leaving to do Vegas. <laughs> so I was like, but I have a twin brother. Right. And so Peter went in and met with them and he got the part. And he did it like four or five times. Yeah. And then there's one episode they brought me back and I play uh, the sister. Like, right. I didn't... <laughs> Again, in and drag. What is your career <laughs> that everybody wants to put you in a dress? It's crazy. There's so many things I could have done. Like, I thought since he was such a jerk that they would have done the bad guy, good guy thing where yeah. he leaves one way and then he comes in and I'm like, hey, you guys are the knights? And they're like, what's okay. wrong with Mr. Donzig? Right. Exactly. But they did this girl thing. So it was this Christmas episode. And again, I had like six scenes on Monday five scenes on Tuesday, four scenes on Wednesday, and two scenes aired right. because Disney got nervous about a guy in drag. And one of the scenes was me laying on the piano like Michelle uh, <laughs> Pfeiffer in Fabulous Baker Boys, singing with Billy Ray Cyrus oh. a Christmas song. Billy Ray Cyrus was, I, I, I'm a big fan because he would have fights with the producers because you're like, this is some of the funniest stuff we've ever filmed and you're cutting it? Where did this scene go? There, there. Who cares if he's a guy in, in a dress? Like, that's the comedy, blah, blah, blah. And they just, they were, the Disney execs were nervous about yeah. this kid show and a guy in a drag. Yeah. So literally, I'm there in the beginning of the episode and then I'm there at the end. Wow. And everything we filmed, all this really great comedy. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. Not, hey. But you get Hannah Montana on your resume, and back then it meant nothing, and now it's like, holy crap. Yeah. You know? And she was lovely. People always ask. She was fantastic. She was a hard worker. She was lovely. I think that when I did that episode, there was a lot in the tabloids about her, like, she's a mess at work, and she's doing that. And it, she was not. None of it was true. She, we do table reads, and she was on top of it. She was a kid. I love doing that. I Love Lucy bits. You know what I mean? That's really right. what the show was like. She yeah. was like Lucy and Ethel. And she was up for it. And she was there. And she was never late. She was never, didn't know her lines. And then on the weekend, she was off doing like the David Park, you know, Baby Cassidy concert thing. Right. Right. Like they used to do with him. Like she was working nonstop. So when she started doing the whole sticking her tongue thing out and being sexual, I was like, good for you, Miley Cyrus. You grab your life and create it. Because she's She's amazing, and Peter has run into her, and I've run into her, and and she remembers us, and she's lovely and chats, and oh, that's neat, you know, and she's she's nice. But I again, I'm a fan. I don't believe that stuff. And when I do see her, if she's acting crazy, I know what she's doing. Yeah, she's got a distance. She's got to become herself. She's right. becoming a person. But if you've ever seen her sing a cappella. Or she does a version of Jolene, I think. Yeah. Or there's also something yeah. she does with Dolly Parton that was an acapella version of something. And it's, she's fantastic. I'm a fan. <laughs> yeah, you should be. You were brilliant on Grey's Anatomy. You were the opera singer who was had lung issues and they might have to remove your lung, which I think they did. Yes. Yeah. On your left lung. It's called pleural mesothelioma, and it's a cancer that surrounds the lining of your lung. So what? You, you, you cut out his lung? Well, best case scenario, we won't have to remove any lung tissue except for the tumor. Man, did you hear that? That's good. Jeffrey, I'm not deaf. What's the worst case scenario? We get in there and the damage is too extensive and we have to remove more. My whole lung. That's the worst case scenario. But yes, it is a possibility. But it's also possible they won't have to remove any, okay? So let's stay positive. Will you please shut up? I can't take your cheerful little voice shoving positive thinking down my throat when my life is basically over. Yes, again, amazing writing. 
crazy situation. These are people that wrote the show that Dimitri and I had met socially. They liked Dimitri's story that he was like an opera singer who became, you know, sang for Disney and became a director of musical theater and opera and plays and stuff. And they really, they were really enamored with Dimitri. Yeah. And so they wrote this kind of with him in mind. So they called him into audition. And then I somehow got an audition. That character on Grey's Anatomy where you were just a jerk, but you're a scared jerk. And it's like- Such a jerk. Again, written by these people, fantastic. The, 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 the script connected with me a lot. And I sang, they wanted us to sing like an aria. And I had just, Dimitri had sort of rewritten Magic Flute to make it like a kid show. And I had done that. Oh, wow. So I just took that and <laughs> sort of operated up my voice <laughs> a bit. And they were like, oh, that's good. So I ended up getting the part, the casting woman cried when I did the monologue because it really, like, it sounds so artsy and stuff, but the writing was so good and it connected. It made sense to me. And with Grey's Anatomy, they don't give you the whole script. You only get your stuff because yeah. they want your stuff to inform the other actors. They don't want the script and they don't want your performance to be informed by the full right. script. Well, that was interesting. Valentine's Day, you were in that. You said that in Mother's Day. You were in those Gary Marshall yes, They were fun. Gary movie. Marshall, love them. The guy who annoys Topher Grace, I think, is how you're described in that movie. It's like oh, that's I, Yes, I think I might have a name, but yes. So we're sitting on a bench, and Gary literally was like a parking lot away. Shouting Sheldon was your name in that movie. Yes. And he that. said, I want you to talk and just improvise. Again, that was all improvised stuff. I improvised for almost 20 minutes because we couldn't hear him yell cut. And they were laughing so hard at the stuff I was saying. And Topher Grace was just trying not to laugh. Oh, that's and Gary would do that with me in the movies. He just gave me these moments to just go, just talk and, and babble. So. Brilliant. You were, you were on an episode of Glee with Neil Patrick Harris. Smith's dream on. Yeah, me too. That's what I'm gonna sing. Are you kidding me right now? Is there a problem out here? Yeah, there's a problem. This guy just stole my song. Uh, I don't know this man. His caretaker just stepped away. I overheard her mention he's a sex offender. Oh, you're gonna need so your caretaker want... a second, I buddy. I run a dry cleaner. I can only keep it closed for 30 minutes at a time. Thank you. Sing it as a duet. Dream on. Thank you. We'll let you know. Oh, hey, sir. Hi, I'm your new lead. And uh, I just like to set up some ground rules off the bat. First of all, I have a lot of ideas. And uh, next, I don't really take direction. That, uh, again, crazy. I walked into the audition room. I was like, I want to be on Glee and sing a song. And at the time, everybody in the world wanted to be on Glee. It was right. the biggest show on TV. Right. And so I walk in the room and there's 30 other guys auditioning for this role. Right. And I was like, oh God, these people are like regulars on TV shows. Like, what am I doing here? And in the, in the role, the guy had to yell over his shoulder because he's watching somebody audition and they come in behind him. So I go into the casting director's office, which is tiny, like this room I'm in now, yeah. and I sat with my face against the wall. So oh. I sat down like this. Like to make them see it, yeah. And there's a casting guy, and I did the whole scene over my shoulder. Nobody else did that, and I think that's the only reason I got the part. Because <laughs> I was like, why would you audition like this when the scene's... Right. Okay, so then you were a voice in, in Kung Fu Panda, Secrets of the Masters, you did a voice in that. No, but I love that. I love that you're doing voiceover stuff too, that just, you're killing me. But that's the only time. Then to be, here's the reality of the whole thing. I got a voiceover agent and then I didn't book and then they said, we're dropping you. Then you were on Raising Hope, right? It's a TV show that was on Fox and um, they did a, a, a musical episode and I, I, got, I was lucky enough to get on that and played this deli owner and the, the dad on the show thinks he's gonna die and so he keeps hearing everybody sing songs oh, or something it's always so incredible it's, playlists. <laughs> it's a musical episode so me and this girl kathy deach who's a broadway chick we played the owners of a deli the guy who plays a dad garrett dillahunt was on maximum bob with me back in the day so we got reunited and it for felt that. so good yes it feels like it. and so then then hello broadway again hello chicago and then Chicago. Like, did you, were you auditioning this whole time or did they just contact you and say, we need a black? I did a musical called Idaho, which is sort of a joke version of Oklahoma. Right. My friend Matt Lenz, who is the associate director of Hairspray on Broadway, asked me to do this role. And we did it like in the Catskills, literally a barn theater and had a great time. And the guys that cast that had just taken over casting of Chicago. Yeah. And they were like, you'd make a great, 
Amos. And so I did a video and they loved it. And they said, can you get to New York for the callback? So I went in and met with uh, the director and, the, and the, the producers and did my stuff. They gave me a little bit of feedback. I redid it again. And somehow they hired me like the fools that they are. Oh, no. And that started my craziness with Chicago. Brilliant. And I got to go and do it for six months and then the cancer. While I was doing Chicago, I had no idea. I was doing Chicago, walking up three flights of stairs every day thinking, why is this getting harder? Yeah. And I started Chicago in June and by uh, October, I had to leave a few weeks before the end of my contract because I had gotten the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I don't know if it's the stairs or the show Chicago that gave me the cancer. I think it's New York. I find those theaters, those theaters are built on asbestos and hope. Yes, and I green. was licking the walls all, <laughs> all the time. You do that. It's for good yeah. luck. But um, yeah, it was crazy. And my neck, I had gotten like an ear and throat infection. And all of a sudden my neck was swelling after I was better. And I couldn't figure it out. And literally like my earlobes were up to here and my neck was huge. I was like, what's going on? And I got a biopsy. There's a, that's a whole nother story. Yeah. But I left the show. They were lovely. 10 months of chemo craziness. Then by, I was back in Chicago on Broadway the following June, like literally a year later, almost to the day. And they were so lovely. They would check up on me. They okay. said, we when you're better, you're coming back. And it worked out that I got to go back and I did another six month run. And then uh, they started asking me to do the tour and I did the tour for like five years. Five years? Like at first it was like January to June or August. Yeah. And then we started going out like, then it started like the November to June or July, you know? So, right. um, yeah, it was almost five years that I was doing that on and off. For two weeks, I did it in Israel for two weeks, which I was terrified. And I'm a moron because Tel Aviv is fantastic. Right. And I'm glad people talked me into going because I really wasn't going to go. And it was a great experience. And even while we were there, missiles were fired during the show, during one of my scenes. Oh. And we come off for intermission and everyone's buzzing around and they're like, so missiles were fired at the city, but the Iron Dome shot them down. Everything's fine. Continue. And we do. Here we go. And you just go on because that's oh my God. that was life over there. And the girl that was our Roxy was like the Britney Spears of Israel. And wow. she couldn't have been lovelier. And it was a really cool experience. It was great. So then Hairspray Live came along. Yeah, that I got that again. Were you Jared, made, were you the were you the understudy for Harvey in case something my thought process was in case something happens to Harvey, they'll pull Paul into the thing live. They'll just put him in a and it'll I know that's what I officially I was not. I was Harriman Spritzer was my role and I was the the ninth principal or whatever the in the cast. Right. And then they had me sort of understudy for um Mr. Pinky. Okay. because uh, Hayden, right? Is that Sean, Sean couldn't be there because of his schedule. I don't, I don't, I don't think they, they weren't doing Will and Grace yet because the sound stages we filmed in, they were built for Hairspray Live and then Will and Grace took it over oh, and right. Will and Grace actually filmed in those two brand new sound stages yeah. for their three seasons. But Sean Hayes couldn't be there. So I would do Mr. Pinky. So when Jerry was doing the number, I would step in and do... Uh, Mr. Pinky. And then there were times where Harvey was in the other room doing blocking and Jerry was trying to choreograph. So I would play Edna, you know, he'd be like, Paul, do you mind? And I'd be like, no, I don't mind. <laughs> and I think there was sort of like a just in case, but Harvey's a workhorse. That, right. that kid's going nowhere. Bless him. And I got to spend so much time with Harvey because I was there. They had me and this girl, Mary Farber, who I love. Um, they had us there every day because she was playing all like Kristen Chenoweth. She was doing all the other roles, right. the female roles of the people couldn't be there. Right. And then I would do Sean Hayes, but we would sit there every single day. It was fantastic. Watching Jerry Mitchell just choreograph and do these numbers and come up with camera angles. I mean, I love him to pieces. He's fantastic. But then sit and hang out with Harvey and act like idiots yeah. and steal cargoes and drive around the Universal lot right. oh and then um 
Andrea Martin right. and um, Martin, Martin Short. Short. And then I was wearing John Candy's suit from a movie that he did. So I'm, SCTV is like one of the cornerstones of my comedy upbringing. Yes. And here I'm standing with like two of my heroes wearing literally John Candy's suit yes. that I was like, I wanted to be the next John Candy. And yeah. I told them and they were like, we took a picture. There's a picture of the three of us together. Right. And I got, I have friends who are friends with John Candy's daughter. And so we, I connected with her and we've talked a few times and that was, an amazing moment. What is your life, Paulo? What is your it's, like? That's like there are these tiny, tiny nuggets of oh my gosh, surrounded by COVID. <laughs> <laughs> right now, anyway, but you know that's not that's not forever. So then the Orville. Then you're on the Orville, and you're playing an alien. You're getting to work in a scene with Seth MacFarlane. Again, I, these are auditions. My manager is so good at sniffing out because when you read this audition. People weren't going because it sounded like it was nothing. I'm a sci-fi freak. Yeah. I'm a Seth MacFarlane. That man, Dimitri who? Like, if he, that man walked up and said, I like a chubby white boy, I'd be like, there are no limits, <laughs> Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> the ring off. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm such a fan of, you know, Family Guy and his singing in the big band <laughs> stuff. And I saw him and Alex Forsting when they did it at, Carnegie Hall, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so ridiculous. this audition came through and it didn't sound like anything. And I was like, I know what that is. Like, I'm going in for that. And so I went in and the casting director was actually not very nice to me, but I wanted the role. And so I really listened to her and, and she was like, this isn't a comedy. And, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, okay. Like, cause you figure Seth MacFarlane, it's going to be a big joke of Star Trek, like maybe oh. Galaxy Quest. And it's, it's not. Like and so I listened to her and I played it as real as I could. And I even took something in to eat because the character was always eating. Right. And I thought the way she treated me and stuff, I was like, oh God, I'm never going to get this. But then I got it and I was like, I, I would have paid them because I got to go to the table read and I got to meet everybody at the table read. And then I got to go and get a prosthetic done, which I love special effects makeup. Right. When they would do it to me at Mad TV, they built a chair because I would fall asleep because it would relax me so much. And two hours later, and I would wake up and I was like, Ed Asner for Mary Tyler Moore. And then I got to do the scene. And then Seth was just around the wall doing the lines for me. Right. And then the director was a, a woman director. And then he would also give some direction. And then he'd say, Paul, come here, let's watch it. And we'd sit there and I'm standing next to him on the ground and we're watching the scene. And then while they were waiting to relight it and stuff, he's like, so what was it like being on Broadway? And I was like, you know my work? What? Like he knew Holy what I was. And he wanted to talk about hairspray stuff. And I was like, I love you so much, Seth. <laughs> In the show, spoiler alert, my character dies. Right. And so to help, they were, to help them out, they had to redo the makeup to make me look gray. Right. So they grade it up to, and they were just going to take a picture. I was like, I can stay here for the scene. So I lay there as a dead body while they all do the scene. And my eyes were actually in the nose hole. So oh, I could have my eyes open watching them. Oh and I'm watching them do the scene over and over again. And they kept going, Paul, you're such a good sport. And I'm like, oh, God, no, this is heaven. Like, I'm mean, kidding. I can't believe that I'm getting to lay here and watch you all. It's funny because I think he'd be great in Music Man, but now we got the delightful Hugh Jackman. Right, right. You know Which, I mean? so, you know, I, when I, I talk about Vakta a lot and people that we would love to have sing with us, and Seth, I always say Seth MacFarlane, people just look at me, I'm like, no, you guys, could you imagine he, like some cool jazzy thing, us singing in the background and letting him do his thing? Like, I just think, he, because he was on that right. Barbara, Barbara Streisand duets album that came out a couple years ago he did a she asked him to do a duet with her so he's like sure barbara streisand is going to her house and recording you know the duet i'm like oh my gosh please let seth mcfarland please hi seth mcfarland watch this and come do a come do a, a recording with voctive do you know voctive do you know my group Yes, I can't do any of that. I swear well, I'm and just... I just I, I'm gonna ask everybody that I'm gonna catch them off guard. So Nikki Ricky Dicky and Dawn. Again, manager, the role said they wanted a tall, thin guy. His character name was Mr. Wigglesworth. He's right. going to wiggle out the door, and he's going to yell at this kid. 
And, and that was the character. And my manager said, this is Paul Vogt's style of comedy. He's a larger guy, you have to see them. And like, we know Paul, of course it's funnier when a fat guy thinks that he's the size of a guinea pig. Right, Of exactly. course that's funnier. And again, I, I left and by the time I got home, I had been offered the job. That's amazing. And then they did a second episode because the guys that do that show were some of the head writers of Hannah Montana. So they knew who I was, they asked about Peter, and then they wrote an episode to bring Peter on. And then that kid that I worked with is the kid that's on Umbrella Academy, and he's brilliant. Really I was gonna ask you about that Yoda baby. Yoda baby, where you're the Mandalorian. I love that video, first of all. Dimitri and I are laughing, having a, you know, I love the show. Mandalorian right. is one of the best shows ever. Yeah. Yoda baby is the best thing that's ever been created. Right. Period. Right. And we were obsessed with it. And I kept saying, like, it came out, like, around Christmas, and I was like, you know, people are going to start doing parody stuff about this, and Yoda Baby, come on, it's Yoda yeah, it's, Baby. It seems obvious, And right? we literally, like, I have these ideas all the time, and we never act on it. And I said, we need to do something about this. So literally, like, on a Friday, we sort of wrote it together, and we filmed it Sunday here in, in the house in front of the fireplace. And it's a kid's mask, <laughs> the Mandalorian mask. <laughs> in a quick amount of time, I thought we created this nice thing. Like, right. it's a funny thing. Yeah, it's very funny. And it got listed on IMDb. Like, that's, to me, that's how I found it. it. I was and like, what said, Okay, and so we're like, we made a short film. No, what is Yoda, baby? And I start looking at that, and I'm like, oh my God, that's, I think that it, I, uh, create, create, create. I am all about just it, create, just throw it against it, the wall. Yes. So sticks, create. And so then the most recent thing that I ha that is out, I think right now, um, is Perfect Harmony, the TV series. Which we did not get picked up. I know. I um, know. Which sucks. But what, again, my manager saw something that other people didn't see. L literally, they, it was a made up script you had to go in and then you had to sing like Amazing Grace or something. Right. And I was like, well, what the heck is this? Like, I don't want to be an extra in a show. Like, I want a role in a show. But I had just gotten back into town. Nothing was really happening. Every time I left to do the tour, I'd come back in town, and you'd have to remind people you exist. And so I went in, and it turns out that they were looking for people, and they wanted, like, four backgroundy type people, like The Office, that were going to come forward every now and then and have storylines, but they wanted it to fill out the cast. And then if it came back this season it would have been like, we would have been regulars. And, you know, so there's the six main and then the four extras like in the office. And then we would have been just the 10. Right. It's one of the best experiences I've ever had. The cast, we're still Zoom and have meetings. And if COVID didn't exist, we did, we were getting together for dinners. We all like each other so much. The fact that it's not continuing is insane. Right. It's a diverse cast. It, yeah could deal with topics of today. It was funny, it was smart, it was musical. Um, we were working with some incredible musical producers. It, it, was, it was great. That's Bradley Whitford, who I love. He's, can, I can't say enough nice things about him. He's the one that actually called us all when they found out that it wasn't going forward. Because he was an executive producer on the show. Yeah. And so he called us all individually and said, look, I just want you to know before you hear it in the trades, blah, blah. And when we have get togethers, he shows up. Again, lovely. Anna is a, a delight. Shanice, who played Dorothy in The Wiz Live, is a, a talent like Gino has been on that uh, Disney show, King of Kings or something. And like everybody's just Timberly Hill, a great comedic actress, so fantastic. Like everybody is so great. And and it sucks. Cause even in COVID, we were ready, we were like, we'll all live in our trailers for three weeks. Yeah. And right. then we'll live here for three months to film yeah. the show. And we were in a sound stage that was all by itself in the Northridge part of LA. So uh it's got a a fence around it, it's one sound stage. So you have the costume department, the writers, the producers, the sound stage. You could build as many sets as you needed. The parking lot, the dressing rooms, and the trailers. It would have been a self-contained little. Wow. We were ready to. We were all like, we all said yes, and then for whatever reason, they said no. So what? What is this? Uh, my babysitter, the superhero. What is that? 
What is that? That is a film that my friend Billy Butler, who happens to live down the street, so he lives in a house, then Mo Collins lives in a house, and then we are just um, uh, another block down from Mo. So next time I'm we in are, LA and come stalking, I know that I can just hit like people. Say, yeah, you'll hit all of us. Okay. And in fact, then we found out like the stand-up comedian Fortune Feimster, she lives around the corner, and oh. then Nicole, uh, another comedian. Like, there's a lot of comedians that live in this neighborhood that you see okay. walking around. You're like, oh, hey. That's but funny. so my friend Billy Butler, he's known for horror movies. He was in the Friday the 13th and stuff. He's fantastic and crazy. Um, he had this idea of this film called My Babysitter's a Superhero. And we all did it for nothing. Like we signed those waivers, like if you ever sell it, we get paid type of thing. Right. And he's very big into to special effects and he knows what he's doing. And I've seen some finished stuff and I think it's fantastic. It's sort of like a Power Rangers type of thing. It's got some comedy but i play this this obnoxious neighbor to these kids to maureen has these kids they hire this babysitter which is our friend miley flanagan and it turns out that she's you know a superhero right and the kids find out and i'm this obnoxious neighbor who's like shut up you kids hey, get up and this weird orb thing lines in my yard and i pick it up and it turns me into this purple superhero villain Right. And they call me the Bubbinator. Okay, I was going to ask what that picture was because I've seen the picture. Yeah, so I'm all purple and green yes, and stuff. Yeah. And there's this great scene where I walk down the street <laughs> and move my hand and cars are going to go flying and things are going to blow up. Right. And then there's this villain who's like a lizard reptile guy. So it's really great storytelling. And the whole time I'm just trying to become more human again. And right. So it's just, it's broad. It's, it's really, the best way to describe it, I think, is like a Power Rangers type thing. But I hope that they can get it done soon because it's really, I think it's going to be good. I think it's good. Awesome. There is, what's up with this pic of you and a few other people with Shirley MacLaine in a cemetery? That was from uh, Valentine's Day. We filmed at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And so Gary got a lot of scenes out of it. That's the scene where I'm sitting on the bench with Tover Grace was yes. in front of the cemetery and then we all go in to watch a movie and I had I must have just finished Hairspray because I was talking to Shirley MacLaine about working with Jerry Mathers and Jerry Mathers and Shirley MacLaine had done a movie when Jerry Mathers was a kid oh, wow. and so it was a really lovely connection to Shirley MacLaine and I think you were at a birthday party at Kathy Griffin's house with Jack Plotnick, Seth Rudetsky, and my my friends, Brittany and Jesse Lenoir were there. And I'm like, I still, oh, yeah. don't, know, I still don't know why they were there. Because I'm like, how what? You just moved to LA like a year ago. What? That was, you know, but it was this way. Seth Rudetsky, you. I Seth Rudetsky you. comes into town and he likes to have these game parties. And so he'll call up a bunch of people and, and have game parties. We were supposed to go to Kevin Chamberlain's house, yes. who um, is from the TV show Jesse and also three-time Tony nominee. So we were supposed to go to Kevin's house, but then it turned out that his house was being renovated or something. And so out of the blue, Seth calls everybody up and he goes, okay, so we're going to Kathy Griffin's house. Here's the code. You have to do this. You have to do it. We're like, what? And it's her new house. Like she lives next door, I think, to Kanye Right. With it's, Kim Kardashian. It's a compound. It's a compound now, right? She it, lives on the side. A beautiful house. And I had met her. I've met her several times through Mad TV, but she kind of never remembers me. And then she's like, oh, yeah, like that type of thing. But she, lovely, delightful. Yeah. Couldn't have been nicer host. Yeah. We played games, but like Annie Potts was there that night. And Rachel Bay, is it Rachel Bay Jones who? It just won the tone. Like no, have, having known you for so long and see where, like starting out at Disney and then just to see how your career has just blown up and been this amazing, all over Broadway and TV and movies and you know and, and, and live theater and it's not no, it's just like it it instills hope especially for somebody like me who I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. I haven't figured out. Oh, but out I'm yet. still there too. I don't know if we ever lose that. Yeah, well, especially now with the COVID thing, I'm like, I don't know what 
to do next. Well, listen, I could talk to you for a million years. You're crazy. Hours. Hours. I wish I lived, I just, I wish I lived in LA because I have so many beautiful, wonderful friends. You're just, your career is so fascinating and you're such yeah. a sweetheart. And I really, <laughs> really appreciate you being my guinea pig for my first Zoom interview that has lasted three hours. <laughs> three <laughs> hours. Now I'm cut not, it down to three minutes. I know, right? It's just going to be luck. you saying people's names. So I love you very much. Thank you You're so, so great. I love you. And please send my love to Dimitri. Give him a giant hug for me. I love him and miss him. Kurt loves you. Okay, so Paul, thank you. I love you so much. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs>